Well, it's almost been three years since I released my first video on this channel. A deep dive into the Love, Death, and Robots Season 1 episode, Beyond the Aquila Rift. Oh, and how am I supposed to pronounce that again? I got so many comments that I was somehow pronouncing Aquila wrong. Aquila. 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 Aquila? Aquila. Right. Anyway, it's been three years since that video, and while you have to excuse the narration quality of my first video being a little rough, it's still my most watched video and everybody seems to love the detail and analysis. Love, Death, and Robots is already past Season 3, and I've been really meaning to tackle some more analysis videos from other seasons. With almost every LDR episode having a basis on a short story, there's a lot of good discussions to be had. So let's take a look at a few episodes from Season 3. This season did a great job at showcasing these animation studios, producing the highest tiers of creativity, and retelling awesome science fiction stories. In the Vaulted Halls and Tomb showed us mind-blowing photorealism. I mean, just look at this detail. I can't even tell it's animation until about two or three minutes in, and only because I'm really looking for the imperfections. This one was made by Sony Pictures Imageworks, who also created the season one episode, Lucky 13. Pinkman TV, the same studio that created the season one episode, The Witness, is back with their signature half animation, half realistic style. This time with the strange and creative episode, Hebero. Blur Studio created an enthralling pirate slash sci-fi tale with bad traveling. Even most of the comedic episodes were fun to watch. Titmouse finally joins the crew with Kill Team Kill, and Axis Studio returns with Mason's Rats. But as much as I'd like to analyze the whole season, I really should just focus on two episodes. I picked the two episodes with the most sci-fi basis and philosophical impact to give us enough material for a deeper analysis. In my opinion, these two were The Very Pulse of the Machine and Swarm. Unlike my other LDR video, I'm going to attempt to break down both the episode and short story at the same time, so we can talk about the differences with each right away. And of course, this is your usual spoiler warning for both of these episodes and short stories. But first, let's talk about our cast. The Very Pulse of the Machine was based on a 1996 short story of the same name, written by Michael Swanwick. He also wrote Ice Age, another short story found in a first season LDR episode. Both these short stories can be found in his collection, Tales of Old Earth. You can buy a copy on Amazon Kindle for only $9, or grab a physical copy from your local bookstore. And look at that, there's an easter egg in the episode where Juliet is reading the closely named Poems of Old Earth. This Love, Death, and Robots episode was animated by an LDR newcomer, the Japanese studio Polygon Pictures who has animated series such as Tron Uprising, Knights of Sidonia, and did the 3D computer graphics for Ghost in the Shell 2 Innocence. They've also done a bunch of other smaller projects. Our main protagonist, Martha, is voiced by Mackenzie Davis, an actress you may recognize from Halt and Catch Fire, Blade Runner 2049, Terminator Dark Fate, and Black Mirror. Holly Jade, while she doesn't have as many credits to her name, did a great job voicing Juliet Barton and Io. The short story starts in the middle as a hook for the reader, with only a quick flashback explaining the crash. Io, the very moon she's traveling on, is already starting to talk with Martha. But she didn't quite know that yet. Martha, Kifelson. Martha is trying to rationalize what is going on. I don't have time to figure out what unresolved psychological conflicts gave rise to whatever this shit is, okay? Nonlinear storytelling is a common trick found in stories of all forms, but I imagine a short 15 minute visual episode like this would need to be as clear as possible. So the episode opted to start right before the crash. The actual crash was about the same, but the short story didn't really go into specifics of how it happened, only focusing on the immediate aftermath. Burton dies in the same way, and Martha, in an almost instinctive measure to hide the gaping wound, starts packing Burton's helmet with the sulfur dioxide snow found on the surface. In the episode, she gets an alert about an oxygen tank rupture and has to quickly plug her supply into Burton's. In the short story, Martha wasn't in danger of running out of oxygen immediately, but she did only have 40 hours of total oxygen to carry and a 45 mile journey to get back to the lander. While she did also need to use the extra oxygen pack of Burton's, 
Her main motivation behind dragging her body along was just a sense of responsibility, to bring a friend and colleague back for a proper mourning and burial. Getting back to the present, Ayo is still trying to explain how she is communicating. So for is triboelectric. And now I see, with I serene, the very pulse of the machine. Words for it. So Burton was a big fan of classical poets. She used to quote them to Martha all the time. We get a hint of this in the episode with the Poems of Old Earth book. We learn later that Io has a much easier time using poetry quotes and scientific facts as a way of communicating, likely because they are fully constructed in Burton's memories. Quotation is easy. Speech is not. This is unlike language, which requires more than just mimicry to piece words together. Sulfur is triboelectric. Sulfur is triboelectric. What does triboelectric mean? It's the process that generates static electricity. I was trying to say that the sulfur dioxide and metal sled sliding across the ground are creating an electrical charge. That charge is enough to allow Io to access Burton's memories and communicate through her radio. After they continue their journey for a while, Martha starts singing climbing songs to pass the time, though she's been walking for hours. A bit later, Io tells her to wake up out of her stupor. Wake. Up. and in a roundabout way tells her to pay attention to the sulfur flowers. Crystal sulfur is orthorhombic. This is one of the seven classes of crystal systems. The sulfur flowers were Martha and Burton's first major discovery when they were exploring Io. See, Martha Kiefelson, Juliet Barton, and Jacob Halls were all part of an exploration mission on Jupiter's moons, with Io as the first stop, then Ganymede and Europa. The two of them found these sulfur flowers early in the mission. Martha and Burton were both ecstatic at their discovery, but Jacob wasn't impressed and didn't really think it was any indication of a new life form. Now Martha was walking and dragging Burton along through this field, and the new flowers were slowly growing back in place of the old ones she walked over. At this point, she realized that she's been awake for 20 hours and exhausted. She must have been traveling on foot for 5 hours at this point. Oh sweet, it is a gentle thing, beloved from pole to pole. Coleridge. So she takes a hit of methamphetamine from her suit and continues onward. In the episode, she trips and experiences a sharp pain from her injured arm. She then takes some morphine to dull the pain. Warning, use may cause side effects, including loss of motor function, hallucinations, euphoria. Better to make it. Better to die high. Although, a sleepy drug like morphine isn't exactly the best thing to take when you plan on walking for many, many miles, it does serve as a plot device for her hallucinations later on. A while later, she starts to hear Io, but like in the short story, she shrugs it off as some psychological conflict. In the episode, there's more of a direct connection between the drugs she's taking and the conversations from Io. As Martha continues to walk, Io starts to recite poetry. These stars across the sky like sparkling dust, like clouds of light. They bore the milky shine into the deep black bowl. Can't you see I'm busy not dying here? Martha hallucinates visions of pillars of women, and a giant version of Burton stands up and walks. I was the world in which I walked, and what I saw or heard or felt came not but from myself. Hmm. Wall Stevens. His choice. It's at this point where the episode largely departs and skips a major chunk of the short story. So let's get into that section now. In the short story, Martha had passed a field of flowers long ago and is now entering a shadowy sculpture garden of volcanic pillars, the second discovery they found on their mission. Martha suddenly remembers that Burton was dead and cries for a few minutes. With both the chemicals in her system and her sadness, 
The volcanic pillars look like women to her, tragic figures. Io is still occasionally talking. Io has a metallic core predominantly of iron and iron sulfide, overlain by a mantle of partially molten rock and crust. She's now directly telling her that she's trying to communicate, and Martha would still dismiss her. I'm trying to communicate. The two of them have been traveling for seven hours now. About nine hours later, the time was nearing Io's version of noon, and she had 35 miles to go. Here we find out that Martha was actually an experienced Olympic marathoner, which explains how she could even contemplate a 45-mile journey. But she was always jealous of not making first place. Clicking back on the radio, Io is still trying to communicate. The marble index of a mind forever, voyaging through strange seas of thought, alone. Wordsworth. Reciting poetry and some factoid about Jupiter's magnetosphere. Jupiter's magnetosphere is the largest thing in the solar system. If the human I could see it, It would appear two and a half times wider in the sky than the sun does. Martha finally entertains her challenge to communicate, and Io struggles to find the word she's looking for to convey who she is, which is where we get the story's version of the what does this sound like speech. Io is a sulfur-rich, iron-cored moon in a circular orbit around Jupiter. What does this sound like? Tidal forces from Jupiter and Ganymede pull and squeeze Io sufficiently to melt Tartarus, its subsurface sulfur ocean. Tartarus vents its excess energy with sulfur and sulfur dioxide volcanoes. What does this sound like? Io's metallic core generates a magnetic field which punches a hole in Jupiter's magnetosphere and also creates a high-energy ion flux tube connecting its own poles with the north and south poles of Jupiter. What does this sound like? Io sweeps up and absorbs all the electrons in the million-volt range. Its volcanoes pump out sulfur dioxide. Its magnetic field breaks down a percentage of that into sulfur and oxygen ions, and these ions are pumped into the hole punched in the magnetosphere, creating a rotating field commonly called the Io Taurus. What does this sound like? Taurus, flux tube, magnetosphere, volcanoes, sulfur ions, molten ocean, tidal heating, circular orbit. What does this sound like? Io finally conveys who she is. Sounds like... Like a machine. Yes. 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 Machine. Yes. Am. Machine. Yes. Machine. Yes. Sulfur is triboelectric. Sludge picks up charges. Burton's brain is intact. Language is data. Radio is medium. Am. Machine. But Martha doesn't believe her at this point. They continue onward. Hours later, Martha quizzes Io about her purpose. To know you. To love you. And to serve you. Io starts to explain how long ago she was created. So many a million of ages have gone. To the making of man. Alfred Lord Tennyson but mistakes all mobile, intelligent, organic life as her creator, and identifies Martha as such. It was mobile, intelligent, organic life. You are mobile, intelligent, organic life. Io can't tell the difference. It's at this point when Martha hallucinates a horse in the distance. The drugs are really getting to her. She tries to rationalize this whole conversation with Io as being some projection of her jealousy of Burton. And then, as she walks, she stops right at the edge of a molten lake of sulfur. They discovered this lake in their mission a lot earlier, back when Burton was still alive. They called it Lake Styx, a horseshoe-shaped lake that expanded for 12 miles, and now they were right at the inner toe of it. And hey, Styx also happens to be the name of the River Styx, the river where Charon, the Greek ferryman of the dead, would take their dead souls on the way to Hades. Obviously, this is foreshadowing. So Martha despairs because she can't cross the lake without drowning in a molten sulfur molasses. And she can't retrace her steps in time with the oxygen she has left, because it would be 12 miles of backtracking. 
At this point, she was contemplating draining her suit of oxygen and ending things. But before she could build up the nerve to do so, Io remarks that she can build a bridge. We'll build. Bridge. Have enough. Find control of. Physical processes. To build. Bridge. Martha just dismisses her, and after a bit of self-reflection, Martha accidentally falls asleep. Io wakes her up, and Martha is astounded at the newly formed bridge. You must wait. Ten minutes and you can walk across it with ease. Martha realizes she's not insane, and Io, as a life form, is real. After crossing the bridge, Martha takes another speed hit and switches oxygen packs. She's down to eight hours of oxygen and 12 miles left to go. She's been walking for 32 hours and 33 miles, but her marathon skills hopefully can carry them to their destination. Now, she was determined to get back to the lander to communicate this amazing discovery. But she wasn't sure how to make sure people would believe her. Knowing that sulfur is triboelectric, she looked for electrical phenomenon with her visor. This is where the two stories cross paths again. Going back to the episode, she has a brief moment where she realizes that her exhaustion is too great for the journey. So she takes a hit of amphetamine with the computer warning her of the side effects. Right after this, Martha discovers all the previous information at once with Io's what is this sound like speech. Io has a core cool of iron and iron sulfide. What does this sound like? A mantle of partially molten rock. Io is a sulfur rich moon. What does this sound like? I don't have time for this. Io's metallic core generates a magnetic field connecting its own poles with the poles of Jupiter. What does this sound like? Io volcanoes emit sulfur dioxide and oxygen. What does this God damn it, sound like? Stop! Rotating field, magnetosphere, sulfur iron, circular orbit. What does this sound like? It sounds... It sounds like... Like a machine. Yes. Yes, machine. Yes, machine. I am machine. And after that discovery, Martha immediately finds the electrical lines with her visor. Jumping back to the short story, Martha discovers that Io cannot physically interact with most things on the surface, and can only help in a limited capacity. Dead egg, I lie. Coal. On a whole world I cannot touch. Flat. After many, many hours of walking, she could see the land air about three miles in the distance, and with enough oxygen to get there, she was going to make it. But Io warns her to brace herself. A volcanic earthquake shakes all the land around her apart, and in the distance, the lander doesn't survive. Martha gets angry at Io, and Io can only remark about how volcanically active it is. It's at this point where Io proposes that Martha and Burton can live forever. After the first death, there is no other. Dylan Thomas. She tells Martha about a black pool of molten sulfur. Switching back to the episode, after the discovery of Io's true nature, Martha faints from exhaustion. Burton stands up and carries her, eventually arriving at the molten pool. In this version, Io is actually capable of moving Burton and being able to interact enough with her to carry her the rest of the way. It's a rather large plot hole considering Io could have just done that earlier, but eh, I guess they need to shortcut the story to its conclusion somehow. By the time Martha wakes up, Burton has already been cast into the pool and Io tells her to jump in. Throw self in. Physical configuration will be destroyed. Neural configuration may be preserved. Maybe death. Maybe life. Join with me. Martha doesn't really have the oxygen available to do much else. Once she jumps, she's able to communicate a message back to Earth. In the short story, Martha arrives at the Black Pool. Io explains that she might be able to preserve her neural pattern. Throw Burton in. 
throw yourself in. Physical configuration will be destroyed. Neural configuration will be preserved. Maybe. They talk about it for a while, since Martha still has a few hours of oxygen left. Martha eventually asks if Io can use Morse code. Whatever Burton understood is understood. Martha makes a deal with Io to overwhelm every broadcast in the solar system with megawatts of power in Morse code. So the message in the short story happens first. After that's done, she pushes Burton into the black pool. Like in the episode, she has a fleeting thought that this could all be a hallucination. But with the lander gone, and with limited oxygen, she didn't really have much of a choice. There was only one way to find out. Maybe I'm gonna live forever. Or maybe this is just one last dream. Before dying. My first impressions of the episode were very positive, but I knew there had to be something missing with the pacing of the reveal. It wasn't as abrupt or discordant as Beyond the Aquila Rift, but I knew I was going to be hungry for more details in the short story. After I read the short story, I was kind of surprised that 15 minutes wasn't enough to cover the mere 20 pages of story. The story beats were less dense than Aquila Rift. There were many quotes from the books, but like a lot of adaptations, the quotes were found in different places sometimes. I do think this is another argument for LDR to throw in 20 or 30 minute episodes for the more philosophically provoking short stories. I don't even think this would be double the budget for the episode, considering much of the budget is in the groundwork, the design and setup of the episode, rather than some flat dollars per minute multiplier. I don't think it would kill the pacing either. Giving the two of them more character development and the proper time to explain things would have been an improvement. But to their credit, a lot of the setup and payoff in the episode was to show their admittedly fantastic set pieces of hallucinogenic visions and planetary processes. Polygon Pictures really put in the work to show off their skills, and certain plot points were altered to give them more emotional weight. The LDR episode, what it lacked in a complete retelling of the short story, it made up in a gorgeous and haunting presentation. Overall, after reading and retelling the short story, there's not a lot of ambiguity or what-ifs that are worth asking. It's not like I was trying to justify the motivations of a character, like I was doing with Beyond the Aquila Rift. A million years old machine built by aliens long past just wanted to communicate with the first mobile intelligent organic life form that it's seen in such a very long time. But there's a lot of poetry to analyze with both stories. The symbolism of the poetry ends up being the most interesting aspect worth analyzing. Let's start with the title of the series. And now I see what I see, the very pulse of the machine. This is a quote from She Was a Phantom of Delight by William Wordsworth, a 19th century poet that was a prominent figure in the Romance movement. And yet the phrase, the very pulse of the machine, strikes me as such an oddly modern phrase in a 220-year-old poem. The first part, and now I see with eye serene, in the story, this could be a reference to Burton's blasted eye socket, filled with sulfur dioxide, electrons, and used as a conduit for Io's communication. Io can effectively see and speak because of this eye. The poem itself, despite all of its associations with phantoms, apparitions, and spirits, is actually describing William's relationship to his wife. Io described her purpose as, To know you to love you, and to serve you. She serves the ones who created her, and now desires to know and understand Martha. It's hard to say if a machine like Io has complex enough emotions to understand love, but Io can integrate very well into Burton's mind. Whatever Burton 
Understood is understood. And recite poetry with a decent amount of accuracy to its context. That and, well, Io is an AI with a supercomputer the size of an entire moon, with a self-described unlimited processing power, so perhaps it is possible. But there's also more literal references to spirits and phrases like a traveler between life and death within the poem. That could allude to Burton's death, Martha's precarious situation, and Io's own position as a traveler between life and death. Io is like a psychopomp that escorts new souls into the afterlife. She gives Burton another chance at life, and when all of Martha's options have failed, provides her the same choice to escort her consciousness to a new form of life. And of course, we already mentioned Lake Styx and its connection to Charon, another psychopomp. Io is literally allowing Martha to cross the river to the other side, where she will meet her fate in the afterlife. Next, a seemingly benign line from Samuel Taylor Coleridge's most famous poem. Oh, sleep. It is a gentle thing, beloved from pole to pole. Coleridge. This is from The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, an epic poem spanning over 600 lines. It describes the tale of a mariner who, during his travels on board a ship, kills an albatross that the sailors thought helped guide the ship. Bad luck to kill a seabird! He was forced to wear the dead albatross as punishment, and eventually gets visited by spirits, death, and a nightmare life in death. The rest of his crew are, one by one, cursed to die by death, and he's forced to spend seven days on the ship with the memories of each cursed mariner, unable to sleep. When the dead albatross falls off, his curse is lifted, and he's finally able to sleep. So perhaps Martha wasn't spending seven days awake in her story, but in some respects, she was carrying around her own dead albatross as a form of penance. She could have just left the body at the site of the crash, but she felt a sense of responsibility and duty to drag her fallen friend back to the lander. It may have slowed her down, but without her actions, Aya would have never been able to contact her and ultimately save her. Well, at least save her in some incorporeal form. While the episode didn't capture all of the poetic verses from the short story, it did have some unique verses of its own. These stars across the sky like sparkling dust, like clouds of light. They bore the milky shine into the deep black bowl. This is a majority of the entire poem, The Milky Way, by Barbara Juster Espenson, a more modern poet and school teacher. And while the poem is basically just a description of the stars above, it is cool that the episode added this little bit of context to show how much Burton loved poetry. Here's another one not in the short story. I was the world in which I walked, and what I saw or heard or felt came not but from myself. This is part of the last stanza in another short poem called Tea at the Palace of Hoon by Wallace Stevens. While the poem itself was a post-World War I commentary, the more literal meaning here is fairly obvious. Martha is starting to experience visions and hallucinations as Io is reciting the poem. Also in both episode and short story is this line. The marble index of a mind forever. The short story extends this with. Voyaging through strange seas of thought alone. Wordsworth. This is another Wordsworth poem, simply called Cambridge describing his experiences over there when he was studying as an undergrad in St. John's College. In this stanza, he was characterizing the statue of Isaac Newton, which still stands today at St. John's College. In the context of the short story, Io is relating to her struggles, trying to parse through the alien mind of Burton, well, at least alien to Io, and finding the right way to communicate back to Martha. There are a few other quotes, only found in the short story. So many a million of ages have gone to the making of man. Alfred, Lord Tennyson. Alfred Tennyson is another 19th century poet who wrote this poem called Maud, a tale of bankruptcy, suicide, infatuation, madness, and finally a form of reconciliation in the service of war. Io uses this phrase to describe the period of time since she was created. She is, perhaps, also using the context of the poem to signify sadness and loneliness at how long it's been since she's been able to talk to anybody. Next, Io recites this line when Martha asks a simple question. Come on the listening ear of night. Come heaven's melodious strains. Edmund Hamilton Sears. Edmund was a 19th century minister and author, though this line is actually from a church hymn. 
In the short story, Burton did have some religious background as a Catholic schoolgirl, which is where Io got the phrase, To know you, to love you, and to serve you. That phrase was in reference to the Baltimore Catechism, a publication of Christian doctrine, which is kind of a religious frequently asked questions. Fun fact, the Baltimore Catechism was actually replaced in 2004 with a more modern version, but the short story was written before that in 1995. So Io is probably pulling a verse from Burton's childhood, a hymn she may have commonly sung at church. When Martha questions Io about how she can interact with her surface, she replies with, Dead egg, I lie. Coal, on a whole world I cannot touch. Flap. This is from a poem called Paralytic by Sylvia Plath. The poem itself is a rather romanticized tale of her own death and details her struggle with depression. Tragically, the depression finally claimed her in 1963, the same year she penned this poem. In the context of the short story, Io is channeling her inabilities through this poem as well. A paralytic is something which causes paralysis. Io has the ability to communicate and change around the sulfur surface to some extent, but she can't really help Martha the way she wants to. Io was paralyzed by her own abilities and felt useless. Shortly after the earthquake, Io tells Martha that she can give her eternal life and recites the following. After the first death, there is no other. Dylan Thomas. This is the last line from a poem by Dylan Thomas, describing a rather horrific event during World War II. This line specifically is rather ambiguous and has been analyzed by countless poets and scholars alike. It could indicate the finale of death, death as a new beginning into mortality, or many other interpretations in between. Io is, in this case, suggesting that Martha and Burton could indeed live forever. And did she succeed? Perhaps the episode tried to answer her fate more definitively than the short story, by putting her message to Earth at the end, after she cast herself in the black pool. But both stories gave us plenty to ponder about. So, from the poetic fate of a woman and an alien moon machine to the potentially doomed fate of the entire human race, the LDR episode Swarm certainly left us with a lot of unanswered questions. The episode is based on a 20-ish page short story of the same name, written by Bruce Sterling in 1982. One thing the episode didn't mention at all were the separate ideologies that split humanity into factions, with the largest two called the Shapers and the Mechanists. Our main protagonists were part of the Shaper faction, ones who believed that genetic shaping and accelerated evolution would push humanity forward. The Mechanists, on the other hand, embraced advanced software, cybernetic augmentation, and even entire minds contained in computer simulations. Swarm was the first tale written about this universe, but Bruce created four other short stories in a full book in the Shaper Mechanist canon. If you're interested in reading all the stories in one volume, you can pick up the Schizomatrix Plus collection on Kindle for just 9 bucks. LDR frontrunner Blur Studios animated this one with their usual fantastic 3D animation quality. Simon Afrael was voiced by Jason Winston George, who has played both bit parts and large roles in all kinds of TV series, including Jeremiah, Stargate SG-1, House, Sunset Beach, Grey's Anatomy, a few CSI episodes, and a bunch of movies as well. Galena Mirny, the other human in the story, was voiced by none other than Rosario Dawson, aka Claire Temple from all those Netflix Marvel series. Actually, she's appeared in countless movies and TV series, ranging from Sin City to a Togruta Jedi in The Mandalorian, which turned into a bigger role this year in her own series, Ahsoka. We start both stories in much the same way, Afriel is traveling with some aliens called the Investors to his destination. The Investors are, as the name implies, a capitalistic and very trade-heavy race, finding any opportunity to further their profits. In fact, in the short story, it's implied that they may have been the first alien race to contact humans. Humans still haven't figured out Starflight yet, so they use Investor spaceships to travel and learn from other races. Within the short story, you get some hints about the differences between the Shapers and the Mechanists, and get a good description of the genetic engineering that went into making Afriel. Like in the episode, the investor commander just doesn't understand the purpose of wasting time studying the swarm. One thing subtracted out of the episode was that a symbiote of the swarm, a springtail, meets the investors and Afriel on the deck of the ship. 
It talks with the investor commander in its own springtail language, about how it was displeased with a certain other event with humans in the past. More on this later. But the commander convinces them to let Afriel on board. And then it suddenly lunges at Afriel and takes a rather nasty bite out of his leg, grabbing a bit of his pants leg with it. Afriel has to hide his natural combat instincts as he's trying to portray himself as a harmless researcher. The commander then lets him know that it's to convey his scent and to prevent the swarm from classifying him as an invader. Then the commander tells him that they'll be back in 612 days and allows him out of the airlock. In the episode, a lot of this was skipped, and he arrives in some sort of transport pod. The springtail ends up biting him in the leg later on when they meet with Mirny. Another minor detail missing from the episode is the fact that he had some sunglasses to protect him from the harsh blue ultraviolet light of the investor ship. In the short story, he takes off his sunglasses and dons some infrared goggles. The cave system where the swarm live is much darker than it looks in the episode. He wouldn't be able to see much without his goggles. In both stories, they do meet up with Mirny shortly after the airlock. Dr. Afriel! Welcome. Dr. Mirny, an honor. In the short story, he's also still wearing his expensive gold rim suit. She's curious about his style of dress, and Afriel informs her that he's just trying to keep up appearances with the investors. The investors respect a well-dressed and prosperous customer. The short story also has a few hints about how shapers breed for intelligence, but they did seem to encounter an upper limit with what they called the super brights, shapers with very high intelligence, many of whom defected from the ranks. So, some intelligence was good for the survival of their faction, but too much was detrimental. Sounds like a bit of foreshadowing to me. Intelligence is not a winning survival trait. Mirny comments on her own meager clothes and says she would have showed up nude, but she didn't want to offend him by, quote, too great a show of intimacy. Afriel was hoping he could stash his clothes away somewhere, but she informs him you cannot just store things away for yourself in this place. She tells him about how mechanists tried to hide away a computer lab in an empty chamber, and the warrior class broke in and devoured them. She talks more about the other symbionts in the Springtails, the only species in the swarm that can talk verbally. Savages, but still mildly intelligent. In the episode, Mirny talks briefly about the Springtails and then dives into the cave system. In both stories, she shows off the other species and goes to a chamber where the only food source, a type of fungus, is grown. She describes how internal fermentation from the worker makes the normally inedible fungus into something more nutritious that they can eat. In the episode, Afriel turns his nose against a blob of digested food in the usual cliched trope. Mm, it's wonderful. But the short story described it more like a leathery fungus or tough smoked meat, almost like a beef jerky. The short story described a bit about the Shaper's mission to investigate each of the 19 races that the investors told them about when they first made contact. They were afraid that some other faction might discover a new technology or secret that would give them an edge. And given the expense of the trip, they only sent one or two people per region. Mirny was the researcher to investigate the swarm, just relying on her wits to survive and gather intel. After some time in the swarm, she managed to send back pheromonal samples to the Shapers. Afriel was part of the team that researched them and synthesized the compounds for further study. This part of the conversation made Mirny rather suspicious. So he starts to talk about his goals here. Afriel reveals that he's not only a researcher with doctorates in both biochemistry and alien linguistics, but also held a rank of captain in the Shapers Ring Council Security Organization, kind of like the Central Intelligence Agency for the Shapers. This of course bothers Mirny, and she goes off on a rant about how the nest shouldn't be part of this power struggle. Afriel counters with the reality of the enemies that they're facing. They are all in a race to gain an advantage over the other factions, especially with the unnatural challenges of space travel. She responds that perhaps it's better to just leave society and find new goals. But Afriel is committed to the goals of his faction to better the human race and triumph, even if it means he never lives long enough to see it. The episode has an abbreviated version of this conversation, without the added context of where Afriel and Mirny are from. Remember that the episode doesn't even mention the political factions after all. This also gets combined with revealing how he has a cache of synthesized pheromones hidden in his leg. In the short story, this conversation and others about the mission gets paced out a bit as they're exploring the various facilities in the nest. 
You also get a bit more insight into how Myrny is able to get around, even in the more protected parts of the nest. Earlier, she had to bribe the two springtails that follow them around with food, in order to get them to bite Afriel and spread his scent. And she repays them again with more food, as an added incentive to stay with them. These two springtails end up hanging with them for a while in the nest, until the turn of the story's climax. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So, the warrior cast guards also need to be bribed with food to allow passage. And from there, they're able to see the queen and her factory of egg production. Afriel is in awe of the genetic technology at play here, comparing it to the mechanist's cybernetic mining, but more in line with her philosophies of genetic engineering. And this is what prompts Myrny to ask about his mission, essentially the second half of the conversation shown in the episode. The short story goes into a bit more detail about how he was able to smuggle the pheromones in a varicose vein on his right leg, but it's mostly minutia. Myrny argues that this is about breeding a slave race, but Afriel counters in much the same way he does in the episode. You are planning to breed a slave race. You said yourself, they aren't sentient. They're organic machines. It's not as if they'd be staring up at the stars, pining for their freedom. It's true. Whether they work for us or the swarm will make no difference to them. She quickly comes to his side, and they joke about the kind of retirement they could have if they pull this off. Although she concedes that she doesn't have much of a choice, considering they're going to be living together for two long years. And so they start their experiments with the pheromones in the coming months. First they test a grouping stimulus, and they notice that they can combine pheromones to, say, gather and then transfer the contents of a chamber to another area. The short story detailed the function of many of the pheromones. While the short story was not quite as explicit as the episode, it was natural that they bonded during this time, being the only human couple in this whole swarm, living together in this nest for a long time. They took full advantage of the pheromones, securing their own chambers, dug by workers and defended by an airlock guardian, complete with their own fungal food source. The two juvenile spring towels were still around, and now held their own with the humans able to feed them, even to the point of bullying their own elders. They of course obeyed the humans when they needed them, since Afriel and Myrny now had at least partial control of the warriors. Many months had passed, maybe even a year and a half, close to when the investors were due to pick him back up. Myrny is excited about a new growth in one of the chambers, thinking it might even be the development of a new cast of worker. She leaves to investigate. Afriel, who was having trouble with his body rhythms lately, decided to stay and ended up falling asleep. When he woke up, she wasn't back yet. He looks in the original airlock tunnel just in case the investors arrived early. He eats at one of the chambers and the two springtails find him. They speak to Afriel and seem to imply that Myrny was found dead. The three of them go to the Alates chamber that they found her in, but she was already gone. Afriel ordered the springtails to follow her smell. One of them finds the scent into a mouth of a tunnel, but then things turn hostile as a springtail immediately dies at the claws of a warrior. The other springtail flees, and Afriel manages to escape. He retreats to his chambers and hoped that Myrny returned, but she did not. He slept, and then he checked the Alates chamber again. This time it was heavily guarded, and aggressive pheromones reeked in the area. The whole place turned into a hostile zone that not even their own synthetic pheromones could solve. He was in his chambers, still figuring out what to do, when three warriors invaded his living airlock. Afriel, knowing that he couldn't stand a chance in a fight, did not resist when they took him back to the Alates chamber. The episode included some of this, though skipped much of the backstory around Myrny investigating the new species, and just jumped straight into the moment where the two springtails found him. They go immediately to the tunnel and get attacked by the warrior cast. He fights for his life in an action-packed chase scene, and is captured by the warriors. In the episode, Afriel looks all bloodied and battered because he resisted before he was captured. In the short story, Swarm's way of communicating was a bit more gruesome and alien, 
With Mirny's body still connected to the swarm, but a mutated worker was created with a mouth for the swarm to use to talk to Afriel, rather than directly using Mirny's body. But other than those details, the actual encounter and conversation with Swarm was mostly the same in both stories. Afriel vomits at the sight of this horrific display, using Mirny's body as a conduit. There is, of course, a bit more dialogue in the short story, and Swarm wasn't quite as hostile, but all the major beats were there in the episode. Swarm and Afriel discuss how intelligence is a detriment to the species, not a survival trait. The urge to expand indefinitely is what causes these intelligent species to disappear, vanishing in a mere thousand years, comparatively short to the millions of years the swarm has lasted. Through her memories, I understand your race. An especially vigorous one. I expect they could be here, competing with us within a few hundred years. It will be sooner. Afriel, of course, completely confident in the ability of humans, does not believe her, and replies that Humans are different. She tells Afriel about the very scavenger that is feeding on his vomit, who were once a powerful race that dominated the galaxy five million years ago. Consider the scavenger feeding on your vomit. Two million years ago, its ancestors made the galaxy tremble. When they attacked the swarm, we bred smarter, tougher versions of their own race to fight them. Our nests were the only world they'd known, and they fought with a fury and inventiveness we never could have matched. Swarm gives him a choice. Agree to cooperate as an intelligent living being and create a new human colony under the swarm's control, or become a mindless puppet like Mirny. She will allow him to teach him whatever they want, because she's confident that, in a few generations, the humans living within the nest won't care about anything except protecting their own home, one that they have lived in all of their lives. Afriel accepts this proposal as a challenge, one that will determine the fate of the human race. I'm glad I won't have to absorb you. I would have missed your conversation. Overall, the episode did a good job matching the content of the short story. Of course, there were some minor changes, and it would have been nice to see some additional context with the Shapers and Mechanist factions, but the short story did end just as ambiguously as the episode, not showing who actually won this long-term battle of the human race, but leaving it up to the reader and viewer. The rest of Bruce Sterling's material in the Schismatrix universe doesn't definitively answer our questions either. However, we're talking about what would be a battle that would happen a century from now, and postulating the fate of the human race a thousand years later. Perhaps it's not narratively sound to have definitive answers like that, but it doesn't mean we can't speculate though. However, let's look at the smaller details in the story and episode first. In the context of the short story, the race of both characters wasn't really described at all. It did say Afriel had reddish blonde hair, implying he wasn't black, but who knows what shapers could have done with hair genes at that point. Even if it was racial swapping within the episode, I'm not really bothered by that sort of thing, since more diversity in Hollywood is almost always a good thing. I do think the gender of each was logical within the story. The shapers would have known that they sent Mirny, a female, to the swarm, and they would have expected that whoever they sent would have had to spend years with the only other human in the area. So it's only natural that they would send somebody that would probably end up as a compatible love interest. Also, a major part of the ending is that the swarm wants to use the pair for breeding, so that kind of has to be written into the story. Moving on to the episode's plan to smuggle an egg, well, it really didn't have much of one. In one scene, they were experimenting with pheromones, and in the next, boom, they have an insect hand deliver an egg. And I guess they expected that the warrior cast or the rest of the swarm wouldn't know that it's missing? In the short story, Afriel's real goal was to refill his varicose vein with the yolk of a fertilized egg, which they would acquire just a short time before the investor ship would arrive. It's a minor detail, but it seemed a little silly that, in the episode, they would try to just sneak an entire fertilized egg back onto the investor ship. But despite all the care that came with their plans, Overconfidence is a slow and insidious killer. The short story especially talks about how they built up their little corner of the nest, right down to living organisms, acting as biological furniture. This overconfidence came despite the initial forewarning that Mirny told Afriel of the mechanists who tried to set up a computer lab, but warriors had broken down their door and devoured them. 
They thought they were going to be better than them, and were able to use the pheromones to completely serve their needs. But as we find out just a few pages later, they were completely outclassed by a new threat the swarm created. And even after meeting the face of that new threat, Afriel has this almost unusual commitment to the longevity of the human race. Order is what you want. Look around. It's always warm, it smells good, and there's plenty of food. This nest has been here for millions of years. Who will remember humanity in even a thousand? Even though I won't live to see our race triumph, it's enough that I can foresee that day. Arrogance. I expect they could be here, competing with us within a few hundred years. It will be sooner. I would never betray my race. I'll kill myself. I suppose it's an expected trait for somebody high up in the Shaper faction, a faction that is constantly trying to evolve the human race to be something better. But Afriel doesn't even take the Swarm's threats of invading the human race that seriously. It's just another challenge to him. Do you accept my offer, Doctor? I accept your challenge. We won't become parasites. Humans are different. And was she right? Is intelligence a burden for the human race? Intelligence is not a winning survival trait. She very well could be. For one, she's right about how humans born from the swarm, who only know the swarm, would fight for their lives to defend their home against other humans. Our need to protect a home is very strong. People have a strong sense of nationalism, sometimes no matter the quality of that nation, even if that nation is a large swarm of different worker classes, processing materials for his existence. Humans aren't usually nomadic, especially when that group is forever bound to the same sense of location. No matter what Afriel will teach them, he will only be around for so long to pass myths of civilization that nobody believes. And an organism that has way more mastery into pheromonal response and chemical hijacking than even the Shapers will have no problem extorting even more control, if she has to. Furthermore, humans always have this self-destructive lust for exponential growth. Even in the Schismatrix universe, humans are spending as much resources as they can afford to find new technologies, and spread out to the outer reaches of known space to gain an advantage over both themselves and other alien races. We are intensely fueled by our curiosity, and that drive could kill us all, either by our own hand or by whatever aggressive race we anger in the process. Just look at the time scales the swarm is dealing with. Hundreds of millions of years. Us humans are just a tiny layer of dust on the skyscraper that is the history of life on Earth itself. We have only lived 750,000 years as Homo sapiens, and only 50,000 years as modern humans capable of writing and communication. And yet, there are so many other species, much less intelligent than us, who have thrived as long as the last mass extinction event, and even microbiological forms who have lasted much longer than that. Less intelligent species only care for their own survival, and aren't overly ambitious about expanding their own zone, since there are various checks and balances within natural evolution. That means that the growth of the species is slow, but steady enough to not be self-destructive to its own ecosystem. It's true that a highly intelligent species can dominate to become the apex predator. Humans are the apex predator when it comes to our ecosystem here on Earth. But it also means that we're now fighting our own inclination for exponential growth, just to maintain the ecosystem that'll support us. We have the power to wipe out any species on Earth, including our own, but we actively try to keep any species away from extinction as much as we can. However, we don't know exactly how that'll play out over the course of millions of years, because humans are the only highly intelligent species we're aware of, and we haven't had nearly enough history on Earth to point to. In fact, back when we were early Homo sapiens, we had a much longer period of time, hundreds of thousands of years, before we got to the point of communication, proper civilizations, and growth patterns that jeopardize our own ecosystems. Even the Industrial Revolution was only 150 years ago, and that was a major turning point towards long-term climate change. And what does that mean for an ecosystem like the Swarm? It may exist as a slow growth, less intelligent set of life forms in the long term, but with the capability of detecting intelligence, it can quickly evolve its ecosystem to respond to threats as a short-term problem, and absorb those threatening species into its ecosystem. It's a controlled evolution that doesn't suffer from the downsides of a typical intelligent species. On the positive side, 
humans are still a very resilient species. While we tend to fight each other, practice nationalistic politics that segregate each other, and greedily gobble up ecological resources, when we're brought to the brink of extinction or some other existential threat, we band together and survive. So it was only when your world was threatened with destruction that you became what you are now? Yes. Well, that's where we are. You say we're on the brink of destruction, and you're right. But it's only on the brink that people find the will to change. Only at the precipice do we evolve. Even going as far back as when the meteor fell that caused Earth's last extinction event, the dominant species, the dinosaurs, fell, and these little squirrel creatures that eventually evolved into humans remained. Is that to say that humans as a species could even survive another meteor? That's really hard to predict. But our earliest ancestors have at least a history of surviving such things, and we now possess enough intelligence to build civilizations that could survive such a harsh post-apocalyptic future, or just prevent it in the first place. Also, we're not nearly as monolithic as the swarm. I don't mean to say that the swarm functions as one organism, but it does function with a singular purpose, with almost a hive mind mentality. Humans are driven by different means and goals. We are a collection of independent thinkers. Even the swarm admits this. Our nests were the only world they'd known, and they fought with a fury and inventiveness we never could have matched. Some of us have a natural inclination to rebel. Some of the biggest turning points in our history were from people who bucked the status quo or rebelled against their societal ideals. Despite the swarm's confidence that they could create more powerful humans that are completely loyal to them, their overconfidence could come crashing down by a single spark of dissent that grew among their tribe, and hit itself until a pivotal moment in battle. So who would actually survive in this conflict? That's still really hard to tell, but I think the biggest determining factor is whether we can temper our own self-destructiveness enough to survive as a species. In the timescales that govern the lifespans of entire species, we are our own worst enemy. Well, I may have been a little late, but that finishes up my analysis of, in my opinion, the two best episodes of Love, Death, and Robots Season 3, or at least the episodes that had the most science fictional curiosity. The very pulse of the machine tackled the discovery of an alien construct the size of a moon, hidden in plain sight, and how death may not be the final state of existence. While Swarm tackled the discovery of an alien ecosystem, and how this human species has such a short existence in comparison to other life in the universe. Both episodes had very different narrative tones and outcomes, but still had a lot of details worth discussion. Regardless, I think Season 3 is definitely on par, or even exceeds Season 1, and I hope you enjoyed this breakdown. I still plan on tackling Season 2 at some point. I have a few other video game analysis projects I want to tackle first. Sorry, these videos are pretty long and involved, and I'd like to space them out with smaller projects in between. This is still a part-time hobby for me, so I'll work on these when I can, and when other hobbies don't get in the way. Even though Season 4 was announced way back in August 2022, it's still expected to get a release eventually, hopefully sometime in 2024. And maybe, just maybe, I'll manage to release another analysis video for Season 4 in a timely manner. Anyway, bye for now, and I hope to see you in the next one.